Welcome back to the garage. In this video, we're gonna be fixing a lot of the problems that my E46 has. We're gonna start with the thing that's causing the engine to idle rough and even stall when it comes to a stop. And the reason for that is the crankcase ventilation system. It's got a lot of vacuum leaks. It's probably clogged up. I don't really know, but I don't have any records of it ever being replaced. And it really should be replaced about every 100,000 miles. So that's what we're gonna be attacking first. Now you can see I'm not in my home garage. I'm at Blue Label Racing, which is my part-time job. And I'm here during the weekend when they're not open so I can use the lift. It's really handy to have one of those things, especially when you're working under the car. I can see the car's already on the lift and I've already started digging into this thing. And I gotta say, this is kind of a pain in the butt to change out this crankcase ventilation system. So I've removed most of the intake plumbing. I've loosened up the dipstick tube there. I've removed the throttle body and we can get our first glimpse of this crankcase ventilation valve, which is right here. And there's like a series of four hoses going around that connect to that. And all of them have a potential to leak, but I'm thinking the leak is really coming from this one that goes directly into the valve cover right there. So I'm just gonna keep cracking on here. While I have everything taken apart, I'll likely replace the oil filter housing gasket, which requires removing the alternator. And I'll also replace the Vanos high pressure oil feed line right there because it's leaking quite a bit as well. This is incredibly fragile stuff and it definitely needed to replace. Just look at this. This is one of the lines that's supposedly supposed to keep a vacuum seal and you can see it just snaps like, like it's a pretzel or something. That's bad. So if you have an E46 and you haven't done this yet, do it. All right, I'm about two thirds of the way there. I just need to finish removing this and pull out the CCV valve underneath. And here is the CCV system completely removed. So here are the four hoses. Well, there's like 17 hoses now because this one broke into lots of different pieces, but here's like the one that goes into the oil dipstick tube. And then this one goes from the CCV valve up to that crossover pipe that runs along the intake plenum. And this is the one that hangs down to the CCV valve. And I mean, these are all just old brittle pieces of plastic. I'm pretty sure in the 200,000 miles of this car's life, these have never been changed out. So I also pulled out the dipstick tube. Um, I've seen videos on how to remove these on other E46s, but man, it is a real pain to do it on these all wheel drive ones. There's some extra componentry down there that makes this very difficult to get out. You just kind of have to force it out. There's an O-ring down here that you want to make sure you replace because that can lead to another uh, vacuum leak if you're not careful. Here's the CCV valve itself. Um, you know, it might be okay. I don't know, you really can't tell. It's got a little diaphragm inside. It doesn't look like there's any cracks in it at least, but it's definitely something you want to replace while you're in there. So here's the throttle body. It's actually looking really clean. Here's the DISA valve. It looks pretty good. Didn't have any problems with that. But while I'm doing all this, of course I'm replacing all these things and here is a complete CCV valve kit that you can buy online and it comes with all the O-rings you need to reseal everything. So these are six O-rings that go on top of the intake plenum, this little crossover type pipe. And then here's the new valve. Here's a new throttle body gasket. All of the hoses you need. Here's I think the idle control valve gasket, um, O-rings, such and so forth. So, and then we've got new intake boots as well. I don't know if the ones I have on there are bad or anything, but. Putting new ones in there will just tell you that they're not gonna be bad in the near future. Now, before I start putting the CCV valve system stuff back in there, I am going to attack this, the oil filter housing gasket. And also while I'm there, I'm gonna be replacing that Vanos high pressure oil feed line. Let's get to it. Now to get to the pieces I need to get to, I need to remove the fan clutch off the front of the engine, which means I gotta drain the coolant because I need to remove the top radiator hose. And now I'm draining the coolant, I'm seeing that it's filled with green coolant. That's how you know this BMW has not really been well maintained. It should be blue coolant only in this system. Oh well, we'll fill it back up with the correct stuff. All right, so I think I've got everything removed, the alternators out of the way. The power steering pump bolts have been removed, so it's just kind of free hanging there. Now there's six bolts that hold this entire assembly in place. I've already drained the oil, as you can see there. So I'm gonna be doing an oil change on this engine anyways. So let's get that thing off the car. So there is our oil filter housing O-ring gasket type thing. And at least it's still slightly pliable. It's a very common oil leak point for these engines. Yeah, 
and that's that out. So that's the new one right here. And then we're also gonna be replacing that Venos line with this brand new one. because so you can see, this was leaking quite a bit as well. So I'll definitely be replacing that. Now if we go look at the engine bay, you see there's quite a lot of oil leakage where that oil filter housing would have sat. And some of that might have been coming from there, but I think a majority of that is actually coming from the CCV line that goes to the engine oil dipstick too. There's a big gaping hole in that. All right, so I got that cleaned up, new gasket put in, new Vanos line on, and it's ready to go back in. Clean up some of the oil mess in here because it was gonna burn off and smell terrible. So a little bit better looking, but we're not trying to make a perfect car out of this. Let's get it back together. That is the oil filter housing put back on and all the belts re-ran, alternator put back on. Now before we put the CCV back in, we are going to change the valve cover gasket and change all of the spark plugs just to eliminate any potential for a oil leak or a misfire. Picked up six new NGK spark plugs. They're the BKR 6E QUP. Now you want to shop around on these. I picked these up for about three and a half dollars a piece. They can go all the way up to 11 or 12 dollars a piece. So watch out for that. Then here's a new valve cover gasket by Victor Wrights. It comes with the spark plug seals as well. Pretty straightforward. You will need to put a little RTV in the half moon corners just like any other valve cover gasket. But other than that, it should go in just like you expect. Inside of the engine looks pretty nice. Not overly built up with sludge or anything like that. So at least it's received somewhat consistent oil changes. So we'll clean up the perimeter of this with some brake parts cleaner and get the new valve cover put on. That's the new gasket installed. Looks like most of the leak was actually coming from the spark plug seal area. In fact, some of these studs protrude out there. That's where it looked like a lot of the oil was coming from, kind of collecting little pockets on the other side of the valve cover. Nice and fresh, should be sealed up for a long time to come. I'd say these old plugs were definitely in some need of attention. This is the first time I've had the car in the air to give it a thorough inspection underneath. And while I'm fairly impressed with the underside of it, it looks pretty much rust free as I had originally thought. I found some other suspension and drivetrain related issues that definitely need to be address. So first of all, there's this ride height sensor type mechanism with a broken rod here that I'll need to repair. I think this has to do with the leveling, auto leveling headlights there on the car. So I'll need to fix that. And then something is definitely wrong with this CV axle here. Watch what happens when I turn the other wheel. <laughs> That's not looking so good. Obviously something inside of the inner joint is worn out and about to fail. So I'll have to order a new axle. I think they're not very expensive, about 85 bucks, but it'll be a decent job to get that out of there. Now moving further back. Now again, this is a car with 200,000 miles, so it's not exactly sealed up all the way. It looks like the rear main seal might have a little bit of a leak, but I'm not gonna worry about that for right now. Transmission is damp. Um, you know, the output shaft seal might have a little bit of a leak, maybe not. I don't know. I'm just going to change the fluid on it and uh, clean things up and see where that leaves us. Of course, here's our transfer case and we'll be changing the fluid on that. Here is the fuel filter. I've got a new one of those. The cover that goes around it looks really rusty, but that's just a piece of tin metal. Go on back. See these cross braces are rusty, but they're pretty thick steel. I'm not too worried about that at all. Exhaust looks decent, at least no holes in it. Rear U joint, there. Rear suspension, yeah, looks like a car from the Midwest, but nothing too crazy bad, except for that brake line that doesn't look so good. This rear differential, we'll change the fluid on that. Rear axles look good. Yeah, so overall for a 200,000 mile car, it doesn't look too bad. Everything is now reassembled as far as the engine goes. Now I really had a pain getting this dipstick tube back in. I fought with it for probably 30 minutes until I just took it back out, put some grease around the O-ring and in the receiving port that it goes into. And after a little twisting and turning after that was there, I got it to slip in. 
So just a little tip there. Now you notice that I've removed a lot of the cooling system. I've drained the whole system, but I'm going to replace the reservoir because that's a common failure point. And this one's starting to have the little float measuring device start to stick. So you can really never determine how much is actually in it. So I went ahead and bought a brand new one over here. And again, these are a common failure point. They're just made of plastic and eventually they just get old and brittle and they'll, they'll start to leak or just kind of explode on you. So this new one I bought comes with a new cap and a new uh, level sensor. These are good things to just replace while you're in there. This was like $57 or something, so it's good value. And these secure to a few different hoses with snap fittings. And you can see this is the, the float level device that tells you how much is in there. See how free that one is. And then this one is just It'll come out with gravity, but with fluid, it doesn't actually get pushed up. You can see it's starting to discolor, and it, this is just an old piece, and it needs to be replaced. All right, let's get that in there. Now I'm moving on to flushing the brake system. So I'm using this one-person power bleeder here. It's just you pressurize this canister, you fill it with brake fluid, you put it right onto the master cylinder reservoir, and it pushes brake fluid all the way through the system when you open the bleed nipples on the calipers. I really want to pick up one of these for my home garage, but definitely a necessary piece of equipment in a shop. So that should make quick work of flushing this brake system. Fluid is slowly changing from a dark amber to almost clear. So much easier to bleed brakes this way. So once I finish this caliper up, I'm going to be changing the front pads. And if you can see there, there is almost no pad material left. So it couldn't happen any later than I'm doing it really. The brake wear sensor is no doubt completely dead and it's throwing a light on the dashboard. So I've got a new one of those as well. There we are, those pads look a lot better. Now normally I'd replace the rotors as well, but these rotors are actually in pretty decent shape. Just the pads were really bad. In fact, look at these things. Almost gone. There's more there than I thought there was. I thought it was basically on the backing plate, but you can see that wear sensor is worn almost all the way through. The other side's pretty much even, so that means the caliper wasn't sticking or anything. I re-lubricated the sliding pins and installed the new brake wire, so that should get rid of the light on the dashboard. Closer look at that CV joint. I don't know about you, but uh, I think these pads are ready for a track day. All right, so the coolant system is topped up and bled. I ended up having to replace this top radiator hose because this plastic joint piece was cracked somewhere. I can't even see it. It must be a hairline crack that only shows up with water. So I ran down to Napa. Thankfully, they had one of these in stock, 30 bucks, and now it's installed. Now we need to put the air filter housing back in, but the air filter is looking very, very past it. Yeah. Luckily, we've got a brand new one over here. That's looking much, much better. Nice. All right, so that's in place. We're almost done here in the engine bay, but we've got to take care of that cabin air filter. So I've pulled all that assembly out over here, and it's just so gross. I mean, look at this. I need to dump that out and obviously replace the filter itself. No wonder it seemed like the blower didn't work so well for the HVAC system. Well, it couldn't breathe. This should help it quite a bit. Got a brand new one sitting in here. Let's get it in. And that's done. Now we're gonna change the fuel filter, which is located under this very rusty panel right there. Just take off a few of these nuts and should be able to get to it. Assuming I can get the nuts off. So here it is. It's got three fuel lines going into it and then a vacuum line for the fuel pressure regulator, which is actually part of the filter itself. So this filter is kind of expensive because of that fact. So here's the new one. It's a Bosch unit. Pretty looking thing. All right, so that's in there, but I noticed as I was replacing this that this vacuum line has a crack in it, a pretty big one. 
and that will cause all sorts of running issues, which could be the reason why this engine, or at least part of the reason why this engine stumbled a lot, especially off of idle. Easy enough fix, just replace that with some new vacuum line. Now, before we start this thing up, we have to clear all the codes that are stored in the memory on this because I'm sure there's a bunch. So I've already plugged in the OBD2 reader and here is what the tool is telling me. <laughs> Just in the engine control module alone, look at all these misfire codes and thermostat and misfire and signal camshaft sensor and <laughs> fuel trim. Bay. I mean, there's just tons of codes. ABS system has brake fluid switch, instrument cluster. Some of these things may still actually be active. Some of them may have been tripped by who knows. What I'm going to do is clear all of the codes and see if anything comes back. Okay, it says it's cleared it. So I've cleared all the codes, or at least all that I can clear for the moment. So let's see how it runs. Oh my gosh. It runs like brand new. Wow. Listen to how smooth that sounds. Still haven't put the covers back on because I just want to make sure nothing's leaking. And I also want to clean up in here. It is like new. That engine's running so sweet. That is that smooth BMW in line six that you just wish for. Oops, I don't know what that was. So I figured out what the issue is. There's like tons of connectors and I forgot to connect one. And it's the camshaft position sensor for the intake camshaft. It's a long wire that goes from here all the way down into the belly of the beast. And this was just hanging loose. <laughs> Thankfully you don't have to remove too much to get to it. Now this should be ready to go. I just cleared the code again for that intake sensor. So let's start it up and see if it behaves any better. It sure does seem so. This engine feels really, really strong. All right, so that's the bulk of the repairs for this E46 wagon taken care of. The thing runs like a dream now. Now that's not all we're going to do mechanically to this car. It needs a bunch more fluid changes throughout the drivetrain. However, I'm out of time this weekend. I spent both Saturday and Sunday cranking out all the work we did here today. So we'll take care of the rest of the stuff in the next video. So until then, see you guys again next time.